that was very important to um, show that reality. But through a novel, through a mystery, it it you could even see the stakes are even higher, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's some sort of crime that happens. So we're all invested to find out what ha what happens to these people. Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Naomi Hirohara, and we are going to be talking about her latest mystery, Evergreen. It's the second book in her Japantown mystery series. The first book, Clark and Division, was one, I've got it down here, that completely blew me away a couple of years ago when I read it. And both books are Book Reporter Bets on Selections. Clark and Division won multiple awards and all, you know, for all the right reasons. It was just a story that we haven't heard enough about and we haven't talked enough about. So Lisa C. had this to say about Evergreen. I've long been a fan of Naomi Hirohara's writing, but Evergreen may be the favorite of her novels. The mystery is set against the backdrop of Japanese Americans returning to their homes in Los Angeles, Little Tokyo, after World War II, as they try to rebuild their lives after either having been unfairly held in detention centers or fighting with the go-for-broke battalion, with everyone dealing with different levels of discrimination, fear, and trauma. The historical deal, uh, details are accurate, heart-rendering, and eye-opening. And with that intro, welcome, Naomi. So nice to have you here. Thank you for having me again. So much fun last time. I just um, wanted to get you back and say, okay, let's hear about this next book. So let's start out with you telling us about Evergreen. And I want to share with readers, if you haven't read Quark and Division, you can still read Evergreen. The two books stand alone. But I encourage you that after you read Evergreen, you go back and take a look at Quark and Division. So tell us about Evergreen. So um, we're following the family again, the Ito family. And the story is told by Aki Ito. We um, were introduced to her in Clark and Division as the younger sister who was in the shadow of her older sister, Rose. Um, but um, in, you know, from the get go, um, Aki has had to, you know, stand and carry her immigrant um, parents mm -hmm. through this very tumultuous part of Japanese American history. And the and and now, you know, they spent a time in Chicago, which was the number one destination of Japanese Americans who had been incarcerated in camps. Um, but her home is Los Angeles. And now Aki and her parents get to return home. But home is not the same as they left it in 1942. Um, Aki comes. She's a nurse's aide and she works in this area called Boyle Heights which actually had been the center for a lot of um, Jewish Americans. Mm. Um, and it was the number one congregation, actually, of uh, Jewish Americans um, on the West Coast. Um, but then after World War II, the, um, they got, you know, official, you, you, you're, a, you're a white person now, so you, you don't, you're not bound by racial covenants. So they move on to the West side of Los Angeles. Whereas, so it's, this community, Bull Heights, is like a way station. It's for disenfranchised people. It's for um, immigrants. It's for working class folks. And that's where the Ito family find themselves. And that's where um, this hospital is that she's working in. So Aki, um, you know, she also has another identity. She's a married woman. She's mm -hmm. a newlywed. But her husband at, at in the beginning is overseas, still in Europe even though the fighting is over, but he um, has to get enough points to be honorably discharged. So he's still over there. There are all these and, things you don't think about, the, the points to get to come home. Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the whole part of the story of that too was something mm -hmm. I didn't know about or think about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and the mystery part, she has a, a patient who's quote elderly and, you know, he's in his late fifties. And it looks like, you know, something has happened to him. He's been possibly a victim of, of abuse. So that kind of, you know, um, pushes Aki to find out what what is really going on. 
Mm -hmm. And she takes that case very much to heart because she wants to know, is someone of their people doing this to him? What is happening? Where is this abuse coming from? And that charges her up. And she's intrepid on every trying to figure out, you know, like what is going on with people, even when she's heading the wrong direction, she will pivot very quickly to the right one. You know, before we get into a big discussion about the book, there's an epigraph at the start that gives readers immediate pause. I mean, I read this and it really took me away. I was just wondering if you could read a portion of it because it really t sets the stage for where we are right now with Evergreen. Definitely. It's only one page, so it's short. Mm -hmm. While we were gone, the military dismantled our fishing village in Terminal Island. While we were gone, schools and cities buried our Japanese community gardens. While we were gone, Dutch immigrants looked after our flower market in downtown Los Angeles. While we were gone, Black defense workers from the Deep South, having no other place to live, moved into empty buildings of Little Tokyo. While we were gone, beloved classmates mourned our absence. While we were gone, thieves plundered our storage units. While we were gone, Baptist churches rented our temple buildings. While we were gone, our competitors took over our farming operations and produce markets. While we were gone, friends wrote letters asking the government to release our East Safe Fathers from alien detention centers. While we were gone, White Memorial Hospital birthed babies in our hospital in Boyle Heights. And then, after four years, we returned. And it really sets the stage for everything that was upset of these people's lives. So someone might have been in the flower market. Someone might have been working. And, and you just talk about each of the places where these people were touched and then came back. And life was going on in this particular part of the country, but not with them as a part of it. So it's challenging when they come back. Well, relocating to Chicago was hard. And that was like, you know, a very brittle step. Coming back to a place that had been home and you picture home a certain way when you've left and coming back has got to be much more devastating. What drew you to want to write about this as, is it just someplace that you think people didn't really think about? Yeah, I mean, I view uh, Clark and Division and Evergreen as kind of bookends mm -hmm. about this reset, the reseller settlement period. And so many people did go back. You know, I think the government, they wanted people to kind of disappear and be spread out through the nation. But, you know, Chicago, you know, for all its charms, it gets very cold in the wintertime. <laughs> and these folks are not used to it. And they want to, and plus home is still home. So mm -hmm. when they are able, they they go back to the West Coast. And um, so I thought that was very important to um, show that reality. But through a novel, through a mystery, it it you could even see the stakes are even higher, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's some sort of crime that happens. So we're all invested to find out what, ha what happens to these people. Yeah. And at one point, Aki is told, I think it is awful what they did to you people. And she, she tears up as she hears this because the word they is what bothers her because was it not knowing who exactly what to blame? Like, who are you blaming in this kind of situation? You're blaming the government? Are you blaming the people who came in and took over your property? And that they becomes this really big kind of anonymous kind of a thing. It's not one person came and said this to you. It was the world happened to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, and, and for someone else, an outsider to articulate it and say it like that, um, is moving to her as well, because mm -hmm. I think she's just been programmed like the other Japanese Americans, like just keep on trudging forward, take, you know, go forward. Don't really think about the losses. Mm -hmm. But then when someone says it's in, in such a straightforward way, it, it touches her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, okay, the they's and all the different little microaggressions that happened over the last years. It's not just one thing because the they's also did um, damage when they were in Chicago and they's all along the way. I'm sure the train ride or the bus rides there or whatever, it was just little type things all along the way that just, you know, add up. At another point, there's a discussion about the mayor not wanting Japanese in town in 1942, and now he's welcoming them back. And there's feeling that the man needs to own up to his sins before he sweeps him away. Was this something that was discussed publicly? Like were the papers talking about this or was this just something you uncovered as the time went on in your research? You know, actually it's uh, 
been um, more of a, a recent phenomenon. Um, some people in the community, you know, were kind of point, uh, pointing to the mayor at the time, but went like, you know, wait a minute, we're, we're lauding this man, but here he was publicly saying that we, you know, we, sh we needed to get out. So there, there's been talk of there needs to be some re reinvestigation mm -hmm. of, of, of the, the position that our former mayor took at the time. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to, I, you know, I had to incorporate it in a way, but I felt, felt like it's, uh, the best way because so many politicians they want their publicity and um to kind of show the starkness like he goes into a hostel for japanese americans there's a lot of youth and mm -hmm. he pushes his way in there and he wants to show like what a benevolent and giving you know person he is whereas you know the people who've been you know more involved or in the know they don't they don't forget they never yeah. forget <laughs> no, we remember exactly what happened. You don't, you know, quite the same way. Mm -hmm. And Aki notes that Italian Americans and German Americans were not treated the same way. Many of those who were incarcerated had never even stepped foot in Japan. She'd never, you know, been there. And why were the Japanese treated that way? Was it just because there was that fear on the coast of, was it because we were attacked in um, in a very different way at Pearl Harbor? Was that the reason that, you know, because she's really, you know, hitting a point that Italian Americans and German Americans, the same things didn't happen to. Was the brutality of what happened at Pearl Harbor? Well, you know, what's ironic is in Hawaii, where Pearl Harbor was located, they didn't have that same kind of mass uh, removal. Mm. Right. And you would think they attacked this. It was a territory. It wasn't a state at the time, yeah. but still. But the thing was, there were so many Japanese Americans who were working, that were part of that territory's labor force. Mm -hmm. um, there were select leaders that were taken away, but not, you know, like the mass uh, population. So it gives you pause mm -hmm. to think yeah. like, you know, that would make the most sense, but why not? Right. Um, I, and what's very interesting too, on December, the evening of de December 7th, all these leaders were taken away, the male leaders, you mm -hmm. know? So they also, they already had an FBI dossier. So they were being monitored, you know, way before the attack even happened. Um, I think what um, in California, I think um, academics and other observers had, have said that it's, it was, they believe it was failed political leadership as well as there was discrimination, you know, um, so many Japanese immigrants, as well as their children, the Nisei, had um, created like a very um, profitable agricultural business. You know, mm -hmm. they they were feeding the country, mm -hmm. not only Californians, right? This was like the salad bowl. Mm -hmm. like, you know, e it's like the east of Eden, you know, location. And and so a lot of people had their eyes on that, those farm operations, those fishing um enterprises mm -hmm. and so they were you know uh take many of them were taken away sold you know and um, operated by the people who were remaining in california so definitely i think and there was just there was a lot of it, it was a contradiction um because as they were such a part of uh, uh, many communities in los angeles but there was a lot of animosity towards them. Um, mm -hmm. It started with the Chinese. And then when they were able to exclude the Chinese, then it was um, 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 targeted towards Japanese and Japanese Americans. So that had always been there as well. So, And overriding during the entire book is, are they going to be able to get the market back? Is it going to be something that happens? And there's this dream that you're actually going to be able to go back to the way things were. And even that starts to unravel as the book is going on of, are we ever going to be able to do this again? Or where are our lives going to have to go? And especially Aki's father is so hellbent on this is this is what we're going to be able to do. And everything's going to go back to the way it was. And I think it's a double whammy when you're not only just losing it, but you realize you're really never going to get it back again at the same point. And yet everybody's sitting down having meetings, projecting that that is what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I think it was the most tragic um, for these immigrants 
who had come over with nothing and built something. Mm -hmm. And now they're in their fifties, you know, they're middle aged and you, you can't bounce back. Right. Mm -mm. Like you, like the, like Aki and her crew, you know, they, they're still in their twenties. So there, there's a lot more potential for, um, kind of reinventing yourself. So I think for the, especially these men, they, they can't let it go. Mm -mm. Um, and there's like a minor character. We don't really see much of her, a woman. Um, she kind of goes, um, in, into a depression, you know, she mm -hmm. doesn't really, she chooses not to engage with people. So you kind of see a couple of various, you know, um, reactions. Whereas Aki's mother, she's, she was a very proud woman. She was the wife of the produce market manager. Um, and now she's, uh, has to do housekeeping, you mm -hmm. know, but she, she does, she chooses not to feel sorry for herself. You know, mm -hmm. she's going to have pride, even if this is, you know, uh, manual labor. Mm -hmm. So th there's another, so that's why it's really wonderful to have so many multiple characters. Yes. So you can see that there, it's kind of like us during the pandemic. We all um, faced different kind of challenges and mm -hmm. people had different responses to it. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I think a mystery is great. Um, someone, a fellow mystery writer had interviewed me recently, Tracy Clark, and she goes, you have so many side characters. And I go, well, it's a mystery. So you do need a lot of suspects too. Yes. So it serves <laughs> a dual purpose. <laughs> it's definitely, we've got to have people who might've done the crime. <laughs> And, you know, I liked Aki's mother would come home at night and she would be, um, her hip would be bothering or whatever. And she wouldn't complain. She would just go in and say, I'm going to go take a bath. I'm going to go do this. And it was almost like she was accepting where things were, realizing that if you just kept saying it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's not going to get it better. It's not going to make anything better. So take as much pride in what you do as you can. And that's what I feel like, whereas her father wanted things the way they were. And you see like you said, during the pandemics, people's personalities come through. Who wants it the way it was? Who can roll with what's going on? Who can grumble all day? And it's when you are up against something, how do people react? What do mm -hmm. they do? It yeah. And I, I'm not saying that one way is necessarily nope. better than the other. And, you know, for um, Mr. Ito, he, he had worked so hard to get that position, you know, so mm -hmm. he had invested so much of his life into that so it makes sense that and and maybe for him um he almost felt he had to be angry and mm -hmm. try to re you know like if he just let it go that was like an admitting defeat from the get-go right and something inside of him would not let that happen yeah not going to be able to say this is not what happened plus he had been dreaming that the entire time. You realize that when he was in Chicago, that's where his head was. When he put his head on the pillow at night and he wanted to feel good, that's what he was dreaming of. Mm -hmm. And when your dreams are cut short like that or cut really out from under you, it's completely different than saying, like um, Aki is going to do, I'm going to go be a nurse. I'm going to be a better nurse. I'm going to be, or nurse's aide, and I'm going to go to get nursing school. And I'm going to, and she even deals with challenges though when her husband comes home because they still are forming a relationship. They mm -hmm. weren't together that long mm -hmm. before. And, you know, you're writing these lovely letters to each other, but it's really saying, I have to say the mail was easier then than it is now. <laughs> it was easier <laughs> during the war than it is now. The way these people are writing back and forth to each other, seriously. But the re relationships were on such a different level than what I, um, a relationship would have been blossoming and growing even in early marriage. It wouldn't have been like that. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we took that away as well. I was also unaware that the Ku Klux Klan was active in Cal in California. Yes. I'd only thought about the Deep South. And so tell us about that and why they were out there. It was to keep everything the way it was, the way it changed. Yeah, yeah. I, I will have to say this, though, um, that the district attorney um, and other uh, politicians in um, California really put a stop to it at mm -hmm. least term in the mid 1940s mm -hmm. um so they were watching it and they you know were cognizant of what was going on but yeah there was it was interesting so a lot of my research was dependent on newspapers and it wasn't only the la times or the herald exam it was um a lot of eth ethnic newspapers so mm -hmm. it would be like the 
Japanese American paper where I used to work, the Rafa Shimpo or the California Eagle, the black newspaper, um, some Jewish papers. And they would um, point out like there was a cross burning by USC at a Jewish fraternity's home. That was true. And people were, you know, they thought perhaps after the war, you know, those times were over. But seeing little flashes, there was an African American's family's home that was set on fire in a place called Fontana, which is in a more rural area, and all of them died. So when people would hear about these various isolated incidents, um, this fear would come back. Is this a sign of, 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 of things that will, you know, kind of roll and expand and explode again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it, and what is it going to mean to the area at an ongoing basis? Is this just mm -hmm. one little attack or what, what is going to mm -hmm. happen? You know, Aki's husband, Art, relays to her some of his memories of the war, because we also have to remember that he's coming back from a tough a tough assignment overseas. So she's been in Chicago, but she wasn't under the, the threat of war the entire time she was there. And he talks about a killing that was done by someone who was not armed and it shatters him. And she tries to comfort him talking about, well, this is how what war is like. And by this one example, you were bringing to light how we really can't understand combat unless we are there because he's describing it to her and she's just there like, well, then did this happen or did that happen? But he has these other memories that are just, you know, bursting inside him of something he can't explain to her, even though she's, you know, been displaced and it's just something different. Am I on the right track there? Yeah. And that was um, Art's experience and reactions uh, were inspired actually by my late father, who was part of that 142nd Regimental Combat Team. There were the, um, that military unit was, uh, there were all Japanese Americans, the infantrymen, the officers, however, were white and there was one Korean American. And um, they were the most decorated unit of their size because, and they called them like the go for, their motto was go for broke because mm -hmm. they fought, fought with so much abandon, you know, uh, many of them had families that were in camp. So they, they felt this pressure of showing their patriotism. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would uh, buy my late, my father-in-law has passed away, but when he was alive, I would buy him like these gopher books. And then finally he said to me, Naomi, stop doing that. It's not nice. And I was um, really, I was going, I was mortified. Yeah. Um, but then it really, then it made me realize because he had seen combat. In fact, he had been shot to the leg and wore a brace his whole life. That those who really saw combat um, were not necessarily the ones who were celebrating, mm -hmm. you know, all their heroics. They kind of wanted to put it aside. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that, that part of their um, emotional life wasn't, um, we don't really think about that. We, you know, we, we just think more about the heroics and mm -hmm. rather than the, their emotional psychological state. So that um, um, moved me to do more of a deep dive of shell shock or PTSD among World War II soldiers. We, we're familiar with some things, right? But um, yeah, and it, it uh, ranged from a John Houston documentary that was taken um, right after World War II, but not widely circulated to um, to even like crimes that Nisei soldiers had committed after World War II, wow. um, just because they, they weren't in, in a good place. Mm -hmm. um, so it just revealed to me that, you know, and, and that's what I'm attempting to do with all my books with Japanese Americans, with just humanizing these people. Mm -hmm. They're not just these stoic, quiet, you know, model minority. They're they're people with, you know, they have blood in their veins. They they get into love. They have sex. They have, you know, and some engage into criminal activity. They're human. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and sometimes the community members themselves don't want to reveal that humanity because some parts of it seem shameful. Mm -hmm. But I think um, if we're able to see different people you know, like, oh, they have emotions, you know, just like me, that that kind of removes the separation, you know, mm -hmm. between people. Yeah, and understanding. I know my mom said that um, when her brother came home from the war, he was a different person. 
And you hear of them, you know, like shaking in their sleep or reliving memories or nightmares of what's going on. And war is so antithesis of what our lives are. It is so different from what it is that to even be able to explain it to her, she has a shred of understanding or we all have a shred of understanding because we still weren't there. And if they're saying in words, say they're saying it in you know, a couple of paragraphs, you know, a, a couple of pages, they live that day in and day out for how many days and what did that actually end up meaning? And I think that you did such a good job of bringing that to light that there are these things that are in the background and he's coming home and he's not only like watching his wife and her family re, uh, you know, get, get uh, their, their existence at the same time, he is trying to figure out what's going on. And she's saying, well, you're not really paying attention. You're not here and here. And he's feeling the same way because how do you even explain this? There was no like ease kind of thing in because everybody is jumbled up at this point. Mm -hmm. Nobody's got a, uh, and even when his parents come to visit, like everybody's like roots are upset and things like that because his family was definitely more Americanized than her family was. So what are their feelings going into this? And I thought it was the, you did such a good job of layering in different kinds of characters and how they would each be approaching the situation that led me to do a lot of thinking. Yeah, because Art and his family, they were in Chicago, so they didn't face the forced removal. You right. Know? So they got to they got to stay in their home and, you know, their own community. And that's, um, you know, that's such a contrast to what mm -hmm. Aki and her family had gone through. Yeah, especially since they were, I mean, I remember at the beginning in that book, they were trying to get a refrigerator with some ice in it. So if they could get ice delivered, what that would have meant is a difference. Whereas his family wasn't going through this. Their routines were already set up of what was going on. You know, there's a point later where there's talk about someone getting away with something. And Art says something along the lines of, you never really get away with it. It's what you have to live with. And I thought that was a really poignant thought from the book, that people who made the decisions to incarcerate the Japanese had to live with that decision. You have to wonder what, who thought what was right and what was wrong and later regretted their actions. And I think that there's a lot of good conversation to be mm -hmm. had with a book group or whatever about that, because what you're thinking is a good decision at one point, somewhere on the way you go, whoa, 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 what do we just do? And I thought that the way he explained it is, the people who make decisions, they've got to live with what they did. And I think he feels strongly about it because he's been in Chicago. He's now here and he was overseas and mm -hmm. he's had more time to think about it, maybe. Right. And he's um, been in different positions, you know, worldwide. And I think that kind of opens up your thinking as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I think there's been a lot of talk of how we come to this a reckoning, you know, when how do we deal with things that have happened in the past? And uh, you, and some of some people want to just sweep it away or forget about it. But how is is there a way we look at it squarely and talk it out a little? Mm -hmm. You know, people made certain decisions for whatever reason at the time, but now with you know more information, um, can we um, reevaluate that decision and try to think of ways? to avoid, I mean, obviously um, there was a redress and reparations bill that passed mm -hmm. Congress and Ronald Reagan signed the bill. So I, I believe, and, and sent out an apology that later was under President Bush's name. So, you know, our country has said that this was wrong mm -hmm. that happened to this group of people. So mm -hmm. um, it'd be nice not to have to go through that process again and avoid those kind of situations in the future. Yeah. Not to have to apologize because you've actually read history and you realize what happened. And do we ever want to re, re do we ever want to redo what happened again? Mm -hmm. You know, this book works so well as a standalone. I'm going to confess to you though. I dropped the book in the pool when I was reading. <laughs> this is what happens when pages get wet. Okay? <laughs> I have, I have some of those. Oh, I think for me, it was the, the tub. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, sitting there, I'm just sitting there like, oh my gosh, what did I do? But I will tell you that I was so entrenched in reading. The, the book is still damp. It's a week later. I want you to know. <laughs> yeah. Books stay wet a very long time. But um, I want you to know that I continue to read the wet book, like paging mm -hmm. back and forth, because I was so you know brought together. I was so entrenched with what I was reading. And it mm -hmm. was so well done. It works so well as a standalone. So talk to us about writing a backstory for it. So that it has just the right pacing and feel, which is what I come away with. I know about 
this time in Chicago. But did you really think about those pages of how much I need to say and how much I don't and play around with that? Yeah, I think what has helped is um, my journalism background mm -hmm. um, because, you know, our job is to take a huge story and uh, boil it down and um, think about those concrete uh, details that our readers um, can hang on to without us going into the whole big story. Um, obviously, I have to be judicious about talking about the sister and what happens, mm -hmm. but they're still mourning her, you know, so I, I can't, you know, so Rose needs to be discussed. And I think like the urn um, mm -hmm. and, and that was the device where um, Rose, like a touch point in which mm -hmm. Aki can uh, ruminate a little bit about her sister and what her sister had meant to her. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I will say, I think Evergreen has a, a little more action mm -hmm. um, because with Clark and Division, it, 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 you could kind of tell that was written during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There was so much more setup that I had to do with that book. Mm -hmm. and, and it was also to be seen as a contrast of what their life had been before mm -hmm. and what then their life was now after um, experience camp. So that was a very deliberate process. It was a hard process. My um, editor, Juliet Grams, was the one, you need more, you need more. But then I was afraid, isn't this going to affect the pacing? But she goes, no, people want to know. So she, she's the one who <laughs> encouraged. And I'm happy for it because yeah, I think right. people do need that. But with Evergreen, I think I felt like I, it, it was a looser process. I felt like I, would, I was on the horse and I could just gallop because... Mm -hmm. um, things that needed to be said had already been said in Clark and Division and now plop you know there was a, still a little bit of a setup because I had to fill in some of the gaps of um before they arrived in Los Angeles how what happened in um Chicago a little bit but we're really galloping forward in this and I think that since um Aki has a job she at a hospital and a lot of things in hospitals move very quickly. So I think that helped with the pace of the book as well. You know, you're real, you're in a life and death situation, mm -hmm. from, you know, quite, you know, pretty from the start of the book. So I think um, that that has helped. A couple of people said, oh, this is a page turner. And that makes me happy. Yeah, it makes you happy. <laughs> Now, the last one, okay, now let's see. This one is referred to, we have as a Japan Town mystery. Mm -hmm. And the other book now does have that on the bottom as well. So did you know going in, this was going to possibly be a series or like, hmm, I wrote a book and then I wrote a second book. Maybe that book is, you know. Well, I, I uh, since it's just the two of us, I'll just tell you. <laughs> but, and, and the yeah. people who are watching, go yeah, ahead. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was uh, my editor, Juliet Gramps. I mean, she was the one who actually encouraged me to write Evergreen. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was going, oh, what? But I, I did too. There's a lot of um, loose ends in mm -hmm. Clark and Division. So, yes. you know, certain things needed to be addressed. So I was, but I didn't want to just write a second book from Aki's point of view just to do it. it and that's why her marriage um, figures prominently. Mm -hmm. Because if she was going to tell the story again, first person, it couldn't be just like she was going to become this amateur sleuth and save the day. Um, it had to be something that touched her personally mm -hmm. and something that that was at stake for her. And um, and her marriage, you know, especially in the 1940s, like divorce is especially for the woman, you know, that's um, that's a really black mark especially in this kind of immigrant or japanese american community so if she can't figure out how to make this you know marriage work there's going to be consequences that she not only she will pay but her family so she has to kind of figure that all out but yeah so when i was but i did tell juliet i i kind of can see clark and division and um Evergreen and Evergreen also um, refers to a street in Boyle mm -hmm. Heights. So they're both, um, you know, geography is very important to me. Yeah. 
So I consider them bookends. But the other, um, and she was also saying, well, you know, it'd be nice to have like a series. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the next, uh, this is the end of um, Aki's story. But there's going to be um, other characters and other characters like fathers that I'm going to tell their story. So mm -hmm. the next book will actually be set in my hometown of Pasadena, California. Nice. And it, but it'll be 1903. Oh, so, so we're flipping back in time. Okay. Yeah, it'll be Louis's father. Yeah. And he's going to be uh, this carpenter from Yokohama who comes to Pasadena. You know, I need some more joy. You know, right. it's like right. the, these books are, you know, I mean, it does take a lot out of me because it's a hard period of history. Oh. So, um, you know, in Pasadena, it's a pretty beautiful city. I don't know if you've been here. Yes, I have. <laughs> we, have a lot, <laughs> we have a lot of wonderful architecture and art. So, it's it's really going to take a look at um, the arts and crafts movement and how you know the Japanese aesthetic affected some of these folks and yeah and I, I'm digging out these these pieces of history that I didn't even know you know maybe five years ago so it's been super fun so I get to that's the yeah. home of the Rose Bowl right so right got, and now did that parade go back to 1903 yeah or yeah yeah oh yes did, okay. yeah. I'm so ready. It, so now I get to look at pretty houses. <laughs> <laughs> pretty houses. So that's what flowers. I'm doing. That. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you also in this book too. There's moments where there's there's trouble in their marriage. Like he's stomping off and she's stomping off, and it's very much real life. It's very mm -hmm. much real life, and they're trying to understand each other. And I thought they were very realistic about what was going on. It's it's private lives as well as public lives of what's happening with people. And I feel, always feel like, I feel like I know this woman now because I've been growing up with her and it's like, Oh, what happens to her next? But I can understand wanting to go prequel for a while, you know, maybe she'll come back someday. Maybe, maybe, maybe as a old, much older woman, you never yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Much older woman going back. Mm -hmm. You know, throughout the book, you share a number of Japanese words and phrases that are just as first in the middle of sentences. And it's not like they're explained. And I can't say I can pronounce any of them. Like, look, I took seven mm -hmm. years of Spanish and can't even do that. <laughs> but I'm looking and I just felt like they definitely caught up the flavor of what was going on. Even if I didn't know exactly what that word was, I was vested in your storytelling as a result for having it there. Were there times where you sat there and said, this is where this word belongs? Or were you thinking in Japanese? Or what was going on that those words, you know, certain words were, were shared like that? I, I think that's the... Naomi Hirohara brand <laughs> for me, <laughs> because I, you know, my mother's from Japan and my dad was born here, but raised in Japan. So I, I live, you know, I was raised in a bilingual household and everything was a mishmash. And um, I grew up loving stories set in the South. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and that had a light, lot of dialect because I could relate to um, non-standard English being spoken you know, and I think I am a, de a word, a detective in some ways, you know, when I'm encountering someone who doesn't, you know, English is their second language, what are they trying to say, you know, mm -hmm. whereas like my husband, he's third generation, he, he you know, he's more literal, if mm -hmm. someone said, he goes, I can't understand, I go, you can, you know, the context and this and that, <laughs> you know, and that's what I, I naturally gravitate towards. Right. Um. So it's, it's, that part is super intuitive. Mm -hmm. And because that's the one thing I do share with Aki, because my I have an immigrant, you know, Japanese immigrant parent. Mm -hmm. So I know what it and then certain words, um, they're kind of Easter eggs for some people, um, because they could be loaded words that are so meaningful, you know, for a larger community. So I know they, they might get an extra joy, you know, out of mm -hmm. seeing that. But I also try to put in words either words that are really it doesn't matter if you understand it or not or other words like within the context you'll you'll get it and mm -hmm. you'll learn a new word mm -hmm. but you know I know mensch I know some of these Yiddish words so <laughs> I can do those too uh, yeah and, it, and there's nothing like mensch in the English language right so it's kind of the same way with some of these Japanese words I put in the book <laughs> there are some Italian phrases too. Yeah, and you just yeah. sit there and you hear them and you're like, you know what it is, you know? It's yeah, like, totally. yeah. could I have also thought, I've never thought about using palm olive for baths, okay? Uh, yeah. And it was a product 
that was spoken of more than once. Was the product of palm olive different than the dishwashing detergent I think of today? Yeah, it was like a bar of soap. <laughs> it was. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sitting yeah, here thinking yeah, no. he's squeezing yeah, yeah, like the yeah, yeah, dish yeah, detergent yeah, soap. Yeah, in. yeah. Okay. All right. I feel a little bit better because she yeah. kept saying a number of times, I'm going to go in and enjoy the palm olive bath. <laughs> yeah, and I'm yeah. like, okay, wait a second. <laughs> At this point, is Naomi mm-hmm. getting some like back money from like, you know, general, whoever puts out the product, like what's going on here? She's always taking palm olive baths, nothing else, you know? It was yeah. really- well, it was also to show like you had to make something out of, out of you know. Yeah, it was out of nothing. Yeah, yeah. That, that was your exactly. luxury. Your luxury yeah. was a bar of soap. Yeah. yeah. What was going on? So you're big into maps. You were in Quark and Division as well. Mm-hmm. And I loved having the map here. When you are writing, are you looking at a map like this or do you, is it already in your head where everything is? Um, it's kind of in my head. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it's floating in my head. I'll, yeah. Okay, Although, you, you know, since this is, um, I was very familiar with Little Tokyo, but um, I did have to physically walk, you know, mm-hmm. those spots. Be, that was part of my research. Part of your research, you're just yeah. being able mm-hmm. to do that. I, I, there were times though, I would have, I, I did do a map, you know, now that I think of it, I, I did map certain things and I, I did check it from time to time. Yeah. yeah just like, okay, can you actually do this? Can you actually do that? Mm-hmm. Will they able to make it there in time? Yeah. I always watch some of these television shows, especially like Bosch on TV and they zip around LA and I'm like, no, that would be two and a half hours in traffic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I have a friend who went to LA a couple of weeks ago and she says, this is really good. I'm going to stay downtown and I can't wait to go to Malibu. I'm like, <laughs> wait a second. I said, yeah. Do you know how far those are from each other? <laughs> yeah. And, how yeah. Long you're take and then she says, you know, like, I'm going to fly back on the red eye. And I said, well, just start out really early from one side <laughs> of town to get to the airport. And she was just laughing. And I said, no, you have like no idea. There were times that I'd be on the five and I'd it'd be back to back traffic at you know midnight. Mm-hmm. And I'd say to my husband, what do they do? Get up in San Francisco and just drive <laughs> to San Diego and then turn around and go back at the end of the day? Because the traffic was endless. It was just endless, you know? So, okay. So when you're writing, do you know exactly how the story is going to unfold or does it evolve as you're writing? Like, did you know, this is what's going to happen in Evergreen or notes outline. Um, I knew. I mean, since I'm a mystery writer, I mean the crime had to to take precedence as well as Aki. You know her character arc of of being in a very young marriage. So those two um, points, you know, of 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 my fork or whatever, they had to be in place. Um, but from there, it, you know, it it was I didn't have a really hard deadline. For, I mean, um, outline for that that book. Mm-hmm. Um, it changes. It changes with Clark and Division. That was more like dominoes that were upright, and you just press on one. It just kind mm-hmm. of made sense, you know. Right. And I think with um, with Evergreen, I'm dealing with a community that's already starting to reestablish themselves and there's a history. So there were so many different routes, you know, um, that I could have traveled. So when you're writing, um, do you write a messy first draft? Like, do you just get all your thoughts down or are you more, you know, outline methodical, whatever from there? Um, it used to be like, uh, when I first wrote, like I had to get each chapter kind of perfect before I can move on. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I won't say it's messy, but um, um, it it I I rarely do a serious um, surgery on um. I, so I think in intuitively I kind of know where I need to go with each chapter. Mm-hmm. So you know I think this is like my thirteenth mystery. So I think um, just writing so many, um, you're kind of writing in your head and you know what direction you need to go in. And you know that you could write yourself into a wall if you do this. I already yeah. did that on book four. So let me not do yeah, that. Again. Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's um, many, many times people are saying, how do you like, you know, how do you know how to do certain things? I said, we've been doing this for 27 years. I know when it's not going to go right. 
And mm-hmm. I know that if we go that way, it's not going to go right. And mm-hmm. you just get, it's just time. Time just tells mm-hmm. you, this is mm-hmm. not the way to be doing this. Um, I feel like this is a great book for book club discussions. Did you talk to a lot of groups with Quark and Division? And are you going to be talking to groups with Evergreen? Um, I spoke to many, many groups. And um, the reception, uh, Mookie, stop it. <laughs> Um, I, I spoke to many, many groups about um, Clark and Division. And in fact, um, there's been some communities that have selected it as part of their um, one book program. So I actually uh, spoke to a village um, right outside of Chicago called Arlington Heights last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been wonderful. And it's it's been great to talk to people who had never heard of you know, like Japanese Americans in Chicago. And it was, it's been great to hear for people who actually had lived there. I I got a note from someone um, who was a hundred years old and her church had done a book group and she was delighted. She, you know, and it was a great compliment because she thanked me and it reminded her of her own background. Um, So with Evergreen, I'll be doing the same thing. And yeah, so you, I, my, I, my email address is on my website mm-hmm. so people can contact me there. Just go there. So was the title always evergreen? Yeah, it was always evergreen. Always yeah. evergreen. And how about this cover? I really love this. It's, um, I feel like I'm seeing there's a man. So there's a haunting kind of a thing there. There's Aki, our, our you know mm-hmm. protagonist in the other books. We've got something carrying over. And then there's this mystery besides Lisa's great words up there. Mm-hmm. So was this the first cover or do we play with this? We, we had to go through it <laughs> for that <laughs> one. I, and I think um, with the Clark and Division, they really saw the reception actually from a lot of women's book clubs. So right. I think that's why they wanted that reflected in Evergreen. And actually some, I'm sorry, Monkey, come <laughs> back here. Come back here. This look great, great together. This look great together on a shelf too. Um, these look good on shelf too next to each other yeah and I think that uh, with um, Clark and Division has kind of like a darker feel to it right Mm -hmm. and and I think that's appropriate and Mm -hmm. now there's a little bit with Evergreen because she is back in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. Um, and it also reflects you know it's sunny over here (laughs) sunny sunny in California it's also very hot from what I hear too yeah Yeah, really warm just yeah, a little bit that's warm. true. That's true. You know, I previewed um, Evergreen to readers in our Bookachino Live program. I do this uh, preview program every mm-hmm. month. And I actually put it in the historical fiction category and not mystery because mm-hmm. I felt like I wanted to make people aware of this time in history because there mm-hmm. I hadn't seen that much about it. And the mystery is so well done. I learned so much from your storytelling that I feel like I always felt in bookshelves. And I remember one time years ago, I met with the CEO of Borders. And I Mm -hmm. said, you should not really just do books in like one place. They -hmm. should be every place people could discover them so Mm -hmm. that this book would actually belong in mystery. And it also could be long in World War II. It could also belong in history, Japanese history, numbers of places. He sat down, we were having drinks and he told me that I was crazy, that this Mm -hmm. should never be the way things worked. And I was like, well, Borders, you're not around. I guess maybe my idea was really, really smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was, um, I felt like when we were reintroducing this to readers, It could actually be historical fiction with a mystery thrown in. So Mm -hmm. if you just love reading um, historical fiction, I didn't want them to not pick this book up because I thought there was such a good message, uh, um, you know, throughout it. And we were going back and forth and they said, Carol, it says Japantown mystery on it. And I said, that's okay. They can see that later. I just want them to know it's a period of time in history to develop as well. Mm -hmm. So that was just, you know, some feedback from us of what we were doing and, Mm -hmm. you know, and seeing about the book. So, yeah. And there's a lot of interest in historical fiction. Huge, huge. And there's also been a lot written about historical fiction in Europe during World War II. Mm -hmm. And there has been not this, I have not seen a lot of books like this. Maybe I've just, you know, not, my reading has not been in depth enough or whatever, but to see books like this come across and really be able to feel like, oh, I never knew. I remember when we last talked that people went to Chicago. That was totally off my radar Mm -hmm. in all those years I studied history classes, Mm -hmm. but to know that, and then to think about the people going back to this place 
it was, you know, it, it gave me a lot of pause and a lot of thinking. And if I, there was a book club that said, we don't read mysteries. Well, there's a mystery here, but there's also a lot of history in it as well. Mm-hmm, to be mm-hmm. thinking about. Yeah, right. So I wanted to you know, have people on that. So Alison Hiroto, who narrated Clark and Division, mm-hmm. again, narrates Evergreen. Uh-huh. Have you listened to the audio yet? I haven't um, listened to it in its entirety. Um, she's communicated with me. And actually, I know some of her relatives. She's originally from California. Oh, that's great. That's yeah, great. Yeah, it was it's yeah. really, really terrific. Because I like the fact that I went back and looked to see if it was the same person both yeah. times. And I feel like having the voice of Aki and whatever under like, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, uh, the, the same um, phrasings and whatever, it'd be really, really great to have. Mm-hmm. So I'm encouraging people, if you've read one, read the other, you know, just go back and forth because both books, you can, and you don't have to read them in order. You really don't, mm-hmm. because I feel like it'd be, while we we're hearing about what happened in Chicago, this one you could read, you know, if you, if, if you discover um, you first on the one uh, title. So are mm-hmm. you under deadline for your next, for the book from uh, nine, 1909? Oh, 1903. Yeah. It's <laughs> due next uh, June. Next June. So you're so, usually every two years for a book. That correct? That's the pacing that we've decided. Um, yeah. It just to, I mean, I think some of it's actually the whole promotion, yes. you know, that, that, can get pretty exhausting but also with historicals we you know you have to spend more time doing research and, so. and it's also time for the paperback to come out as well so if the paperback's yeah. a year yeah. later there's another book before you do another book and, and funny I had to look back because I would have sworn I read this book last year like I didn't even think it was two years ago and I was thumbing back and I was like wow that's on a different shelf <laughs> yeah and people are still reading Clark and Division for the first time. Mm-hmm. So I'm seeing, you know, with these particular books, there's no rush. You know? yeah. Well, I have to say that I think in publishing right now, there's kind mm-hmm. of this false rush that's mm-hmm. about the first week, the first mm-hmm. month, the first mm-hmm. whatever. Because I was at a, I was out with somebody who is a very big reader. And mm-hmm. we were out somewhere around, I think it was 4th of July. And she says, is lessons in chemistry good? And I'm just thinking like, whoa, like that's mm-hmm. a year and a half ago, the book came mm-hmm. out or a year and three months ago. And I think that we are being in the business, less attuned to the schedule on which people find books and the mm-hmm. discovery factor of books. And I think that the, we were, we used to be like, it was here, like the first four weeks or whatever. I think the discovery period's a lot longer right now. And I think that even if it's a favorite writer, the discovery period is a lot longer than it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I'm yeah. seeing it because everything is all about that first week and how the book do the first month. And then you're sitting there going, there are people that are still finding this out for the very first time. And it's also, you can just read so fast. I mean, you can mm-hmm. just read a book so quickly. And then if you're hearing about another one while you're reading something, you don't stop and start. And I think that, you know, during the pandemic, we were a little bit spoiled because there was so much time for reading. Mm-hmm. There was so much time yeah. because you couldn't do yeah. things. But I think that um, I've been very, very conscious of, trying not to have everything happen the first week. Like we mm-hmm. will do something like we'll interview you one week. We'll do, we're, now we're doing something with you on reading group guides. We're trying to like spread the coverage over. So mm-hmm. it's not all, everything happens the one week. Yeah. What else can we yeah. do to extend, you know, the lifetime yeah. of it? Yeah. And even people are finding the interviews we do later. I'm mm-hmm. like, fine, you go find it when you, you discover the book. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, we had something, and I, I also look a lot at reader mail. I had somebody request something for black cake. Mm-hmm. Um, which came out, I think it was a year ago, January, mm-hmm. at least. And we've had 7,000 people watch that interview. I was surprised wow, when I wow. looked today, but it just shows that it didn't all happen the first week. Mm-hmm. The first week, there were a couple hundred people. And then as time goes on, people discover mm-hmm. something. Maybe the author's not touring at that point and they go out and say, where can I go look at it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're trying, that's what we're trying to do with the site is Yes, review the book. Yes, you know, do whatever we're doing, but also mm-hmm. a long tail where you can find it mm-hmm. when you find the book. Yeah. So, well, I look forward to seeing what you do next. Did I okay, see? Thank you. Honored at um, BoucherCon this year too. I, I'm going to be the Toastmaster. Toastmaster. It was fantastic. Yeah, so, I was coming out there. It's oh, like, it's, it's not a good week for me, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. And of all places to go, I mean, that would be a rough trip, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Labor Day is hard for people. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time for your next book. And to our readers, we look forward to seeing you next time on Booker Parter Talks to. Thank you. 